Scripture says in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse number 34, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. And this morning, I'm excited and praying for this service to bring out to your mind's attention and to your heart the fact that we serve a really good God. And so I want you to be watching for that in all of the different songs and the special music and the Scripture reading that we have this morning, that our God is a good God good God. Do you believe that he's a good God in your life and how he's treated you this week and how he's handling your, your life and your situation? He's a really good God. We're going to start off with a song that we sang often with our Job series, My Hope is Jesus. This song is not in the hymn book, but it will be on the screen. So let's stand as we sing, My Hope is Jesus. Jesus. When he shall 
shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, as in his righteousness alone, all this I stand before the throne, my hope is Jesus, the anchor of my soul, the ruler of this universal That's a wonderful song, and I just enjoy singing it out uh, there, that he is the anchor of our soul and uh, the one who's in control. Those are some themes that we've learned in the book of Job. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the great God that you are and your goodness towards us. Thank you for being our hope. Thank you for just being such a great God. Uh, thank you for being uh, the one who is in control. And Lord, that is such a great comfort to us. And we know from uh, our study of Job that you are well qualified to be in control of everything. Better qualified than we are to control our own lives. And so we rest in that. And uh, Lord, we thank you for that. Help us to enjoy your goodness today. We do pray for Suzanne. We pray that you continue to encourage her and strengthen her as uh, uh, she awaits her uh, results from her test. Help her to quickly and completely get over the sickness so she can be back to normal life. We do pray for those that are not able to join us today. We pray that you would bless them as they watch on the live stream and uh, YouTube and the various methods that are available. We do pray that the technology would work well today and uh, be able to help get out the, the message of the Word of God. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and for your blessings. Do a mighty work today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Let me give you a few announcements from your growth guide here that you may want to uh, make notice of. First of all, today is our Firefighter Appreciation Sunday. Now, one of my kids was suggesting that uh, if we wanted to express appreciation to the uh, fire department, we could get our, all of our banners together and all of our goodies, call 911, and they would come here quickly, and we could wave and hold up our banners and... We're going to do it a little differently than that, all right? And uh, so a great idea, but maybe we'll tweak it a little bit. But uh, several of you have made some homemade goodies, and uh, you all gave towards uh, gift cards to Duncan and Caribou. And so we have three packages ready to go to the three different fire stations here in Coon Rapids. And right after the service this morning, uh, we're going to divide up into three groups of anyone who wants to go. And uh, we're going to go and just knock on the door of the fire station there. And uh, as long as they're not out of a call, anticipate that someone will come to the door and uh, just be able to say, hey, Coon Rapids Baptist Church appreciates the work that you do in our community. And folks have made some homemade goodies. Folks have given some um, <clears throat> $5 caribou or Dunkin' cards. And uh, we just want to say thank you. Folks have made some posters and uh, so, and give them those things. And from there, then you can go on your way home. Uh, we're not going to crowd real close to them. Uh, we can keep our social distance and all that, so they don't panic. Whatever. I don't imagine it'll be a long stop, but I hope that we'll have a good group. And uh, if you want to jump in with one of the groups and go, uh, that'll be a great thing. Those of you that have uh, that are going to be kind of going with groups, I have some different scripts that you can use uh, just to give you some talking points as far as. Um, basically what I just said, uh, you can say to them. And so we are thankful for those who work in our uh, fire department here in Coon Rapids, and we just hope it expresses that appreciation uh, to them for all the hard work that they do around the clock, even in the middle of the night, and uh, going to all those different calls and helping people. And so that's uh, today, and I hope that you can help us with that right after the service this morning. We do have children's church, and we do have nursery today, and we're excited about offering those things uh, to our families. Tomorrow night, Monday night, is our Christian Ed Committee meeting, and I want to make you aware of that, um, the, if you're involved in that. 
uh, Wednesday night youth meeting and our R&R service. Next Sunday, we begin, we resume our Sunday night service at 6 o'clock. And uh, we're excited about that, looking forward to that. We do a couple special things. We want to have the Lord's table. And yes, of course, we'll need to do it just a little bit differently than normal. And uh, we'll let you know about that. But then also, we want to have some Sundays on Sunday night, all right? And uh, uh, we'll enjoy just some time of fellowship, and we can still be social distance and work hard on the sanitary things and all that stuff, uh, but want to do that. And so I am excited about Sunday night services resumed. I'm sure you've enjoyed a little bit of the break. You got a little bit of rest, um, but you know, I am just excited about seeing the cause of Christ go forward. And there's so much that we want to do in the cause of Christ. And as a pastor, I think about, you know, Sunday morning service and Wednesday night, but I would like to see us be able to do more. And so Sunday night gives us an opportunity uh, to, to work on some other areas in our Christian lives, to work together as a church to go forward. And we'll be talking about the blessings of a Sunday night service here um, so that we can remind you of some of those things. But I hope that you'll set aside that time starting next Sunday night. Six o'clock is our evening service. Um, coming up this week, if someone is interested in mowing the church lawn, that is available as well. And I want to encourage you to pray for the evangelistic meetings, um, evangelistic campaign coming up this fall with evangelist Dustin Duke. And we'll be letting you know more of those details here in the future. Kids activity um, with uh, the Roots Bible Club, Club coming up July the 24th as well. Okay, I think those are all the announcements. One, one other thing, it's not in the bulletin. So you have, you have strict brand new access to this, all right? Um, July the 25th is a Saturday, and uh, we would like to bury some more conduit back between our school and our gym building so that we can bury phone lines and uh, internet cables back to the gym. Uh, and that will help us to be able to change to a different phone company, an internet company, getting faster internet so we can do a better job with our live stream. The way our phone system and internet are set up right now, um, we're, we are stuck with one company. And so uh, we, we need to connect those two buildings. And so I think we can do it fairly simply, dig a simple trench and bury about 200 feet of uh, conduit or so in the ground and uh, run some cables through there. And then we'll be able to, we already have these two buildings hooked up, that'll hook up the other two buildings and that'll enable us to have better, better internet so that maybe I won't glitch <laughs> online so much. All right. So if you could help us that Saturday, the 25th, and uh, we'll be working on some of those details, um, but uh, that'll be a great blessing to our ministry and I think be able to reach people with the gospel of Christ. Thank you for continuing to give financially. I know it's still maybe different to you uh, with the offering plate at the back, uh, but we want to continue to support missions and continue to take care of the work of God here in Coon Rapids. And uh, so we're going to pray for the offering and then we are going to uh, enjoy the offertory here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for meeting our needs. We thank you for your goodness and providing for our needs. We do pray that you'd help us to continue to worship you with the first portion of all of our income. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistakes. And uh, what's been a great, great truth from the book of Job that we've seen as well. This last Friday, we had a kids activity. This summer, we've been doing some kids activities or are doing some kids activities instead of vacation Bible school. And uh, we had some good time. Appreciate folks that were able to come with their kids. And uh, Titus had him take some pictures and uh, he made a little video I'm going to show in just a moment. Uh, we gave out some different prizes here and uh, we needed to give one out to Haley. So I think the Lundy's got those. So Haley, do you want to come get your prize from playing? From coming to the, the um, can you want to come up and get it? All right, here is a cool ring. The biggest dirt loops that you've ever seen. <laughs> And uh, we enjoyed having her. And so I just wanted to show, I, I, I wanted to show you this. Just, uh, it's great to have fellowship and uh, enjoy um, time together with God's people. And so here's just a couple minute video that we put together for. Had a good time and appreciate everybody who helped out in that regard. We'll have another activity. We're going to participate in the Roots Bible Club coming up on the 24th and uh, another kids activity here. So let's go to Psalms, the book of Psalms 107 for our scripture reading this morning. Psalm 107, a little bit longer passage here and I uh, want to read through these uh, verses here. Psalm 107 and... Uh, I want you to notice this theme of God's goodness, and he's going to use these, th this phrase several times in uh, Psalm 107. And uh, let's try something different here. If you're able to follow along, if you're able to read, when we get to verse 8, uh, verse 15, 
um, verse 21, verse number 31. It's going to say, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let's see if you can say that with all together when we get to that verse, all right? And uh, we'll say that in unison when we get to those verses. Uh, I think there's one more in there that I missed, uh, but it says it four or five times. And uh, let's enjoy sing, saying those together. I'll start Psalm 107, verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. Together, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and ironed, because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and brake their bands in sunder together. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat and they draw near unto the gray gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions together. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commanded and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh a storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven together. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. God is a very good God. And the Houston kids are going to come now at this time and sing a song about God's goodness. Joseph went to Egypt land, he wasn't there alone. He knew the Lord was there with him, though he was far from home. In every task that Joseph had, he did as he should. No others meant to do him harm. God meant it all for good. God is good through every trial and test. God is good, and I know his way is best. The purpose of His will Still I understand God is good Endure each task God 
sends to you and seek the Lord each day. When things are tough, God's strong enough to help you find your way. Remember Joseph, trust in God, did the best he could. In every trial, Joseph found God meant it all for good. God is good through every trial and test. God is good, and I know His way is best. Even when I cannot see the purpose of his plan. Still I understand God is good. Still I understand God is Today we're going to be singing some songs about the Lord's goodness. Now let's sing, uh, The Lord is Good, number 200. Let's stand and sing. Let's turn to hymn number 207, 207. Surely goodness and mercy.
let's turn to hymn 604. And as we sing this, we will dismiss the children to Children's Church, uh, four years old for the fourth grade. Let's go to the book of Job, chapter 42, Lord willing, one more time here to a dear friend, the book of Job. We've enjoyed, at least I've enjoyed, I hope you have as well, seeing the Word of God from this book of the Bible. Right before Psalms is the book of Job, and we're going to be in Job chapter 42 here this morning. And we're going to pick up the story in verse number 10, is the context of our message here this morning. Job 42 and verse number 10, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before. And did eat bread with him in his house, and they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a 1,000 yoke of oxen and a 1,000 she-asses. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first Jemima, and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third Karen Hapak. And in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. After this lived Job in 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. Everyone loves the ending of an epic story, and the ending of the book of Job is one of the best endings of any stories. Good endings have the good guy winning, and the bad guys losing, and the good guys living happily ever after. And in the last chapter of Job, that is exactly what we have. The good guy, God, wins, and Job wins when he bows the knee to God. The bad guys, which are the friends of Job and even Satan himself, lose. And finally, Job, the good guy, will live happily ever after. Happily ever after. Who really believes that stuff? I mean, it works well for movies. And uh, before that, it worked well for fairy tales. But is that real life? Is that the way the world works? I mean, in a 30-minute television show, why does the show always have to resolve some issue and end well? In a movie or in a good story, why does the story have to come to some sort of conclusion? And if it doesn't resolve the problem, you know there's a part two coming. Why is it that the thing is not over until the story is resolved? Until there is a happily ever after here? Why does a story... Have you ever thought about it? In humanity, why does a story have to have a good ending to it? Why do humans just want a story to have a good ending? Happily ever after. Let's go one step further, though. God is good. 
I mean, really, is he? I mean, if God is good, why does he allow suffering where human beings that he created, he made this human being, and yet this human being, he allows to have suffering in their life? If God is really that good of a God, why does he allow uh, evil where bad people do such horrible things to people that don't deserve it? God is good? Yeah, right. Is that our expression? Is that our thought? And these last verses of Job resolve this issue in our hearts. Because the book of Job isn't over until the very last verse. In the first six verses of this chapter, Job comes to the place where he says, God, I realize you know everything. I don't know all that's going on. And so it's very possible that in my suffering, you are doing something that I would not realize. And he bows his knee, understanding that God can do whatever God wants to with Job's life because his life belongs to God. In verses 7 through 10, the bad guys lose, and that's important because it shows that God does care about right and wrong when he makes sure that the bad guys lose. But the last eight verses are so important because they tell us that God is good. The book of Job is a book about suffering. And in a story about suffering, in a story about injustice, in a story where someone suffers unfairly, it ends on this note that even when we suffer, God is good. See, you can be in verses 1 through 6 of this chapter where Job is, and you can say, God, I realize you know more than I do. I realize that you're in control. I realize you can do whatever whatever you want with my life. I realize you're sovereign. I should bow my knee to what you're doing in my life. But I don't like it very much. And God, if you're allowing all of this in my life, how can you really be a good God? And we shift to wondering that. And the story of Job is exactly what we need because it reminds us that when you go through times of suffering, you must believe that God is good. There's an older man by the name of John, and and John loved God with all of his heart, all of his life. John was one of these people that just had this practice of saying God is good. When when Job or when John rather got married, um, John said God is good. When John's wallet was stolen, God is good. When John's father died, God is good. It didn't seem like it mattered what happened in John's life. He was just constantly going around saying, God is good. God is good. And then John was diagnosed with cancer. And they said it was spreading rapidly through his body. He had a mere few weeks to live. And he was very close with his pastor, Charles. And and Charles would go and and visit him on a daily basis. And every day, they would spend time with each other. And and as Charles would leave, Pastor Charles would leave at the end of the day, um, John would say to him, God is good. Every day, God is good. God is good. And here they are, good friends. They're visiting every day. And one day as Charles is getting ready to leave and as, as he's getting ready to head back home, he knows that John doesn't have much time to, to live here. He stops and he says, you know, John, I just don't understand it. I mean, I know the Lord. I love the Lord as much as you do. And yet you keep saying God is good. I mean, I can understand God is good in the good times. And I can understand that God is even good in the hard times. But John, when you love God with all of your heart, and now God is, God is, is take, allowing your life to go. He's taking your, your life here. You're laying on your deathbed. How can you be so optimistic and say, God is good? John, in his weakened condition, just smiled a little bit. And he said, you know, in our life, we are put here to serve God, and then go to heaven and live with Him. And I've served the Lord with my life. And now, God is just allowing me to go to heaven and be with Him. God is good. And he could sit there, he could lay there in his hospital bed, and he could go through all that he experienced and finally just call out and say, God is good even in suffering. And I want you to see this truth, and I pray the Spirit of God would burn it into your soul that even in times of suffering, God is good. Father, I do thank you for your word. I pray now as we we consider this truth that you would just overwhelm our souls and our hearts with your goodness, nothing else. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to just see two points mainly here today, and our second point is going to have a few subpoints to it, but I, I want you to see a couple truths here. The first truth that I want you to see as we studied is this. God was good, so good to Job. He was very good to Job. By this point in time, Job had proved that I'm going to serve God for nothing. It doesn't matter if I get nothing out of it, I'm going to serve God. In fact, Job had proved I'm going to serve God even if I have to suffer. God is still worth serving. And I will go one third step further, and I, Job is saying I will serve God even if it means praying for my enemies, which is what we considered last week. Satan is defeated, and the test is over. And so, verse number 10, would you look at it there? It says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. This word captivity is an interesting word. It makes us think in the Old Testament of the children of Israel, when they sinned, God sold them into captivity, right? And many times they were, they were enslaved, they were taken to another country, they lost all of their possessions, some of them died, some of them experienced disease and hardship and starvation. They experienced incredible suffering as a result of turning away from God. And what God describes Job's suffering as is that captivity. God describes it in that way as if Job had been like the children of Israel in the Old Testament and committed some horrible, horrible sin. Job got all of that suffering brought on his life. Now, Job hadn't committed that horrible sin, but he had the consequences of it as if they were consequences because God was trying to make a point. You know that. And so now that the test is over, Job has won his final battle, God turns that captivity around. And the end of the verse tells us that Job was given twice as much by the Lord as he had before. He gives him double, and he's going to describe that in the rest of these verses. You know, it's interesting, in Exodus chapter 22, verse 7, you don't have to turn there, but God describes uh, the laws for the children of Israel. And if there were a thief that stole, when he was caught, he was supposed to return not just what he took, but double the amount. God returns to Job double of what God had taken from him. And it's interesting that God does it in that dynamic because there is a sense in Job chapter 2 and verse number 3 where God says, you know what, I did take Job's stuff without cause. God's returning to him a double portion of what he had taken. And it starts off in verse number 11. Your eyes can just follow down if you want to as I talk about some of these things. I want, to re I want to emphasize and remind you of what all Job got. First of all, God restored his family and friends to him. It wasn't so much that these friends and family were fickle in a sense, that they only wanted to be around Job when things were going great. But God, part of the test upon Job was that God allowed all of his friends, but three, all of his family to walk away from him. Job chapter 19, verses 13 and 14, Job suffered alone. And that was part of the agony of it. The only people that comfort him are three friends, and they proved to be enemies. That was part of it. And so when God turns the captivity of Job, his family and his friends come back to him. And they begin to comfort him. And they all take up an offering. And that's the beginning of the money that Job has. And over the period of the rest of his life, it grows and God blesses him to where he has the possessions that are brought out here. Can I remind you what Job chapter 1 tells us? It tells us that of all the men of that part of the world, Job was the wealthiest man. The greatest man of the East. Every year, you know, the, the, the statisticians and the, the, the people in the news are, are doing the debate as to who's the wealthiest man in the world, you know? Is it the Amazon guy? Is it Bill Gates? You know, who's taken over as the wealthiest man in the world and all this stuff? Well, Job was the wealthiest man. And now, God gives him double for it. If you wanted to, you could go to chapter number one and you could write down or you could look as I walk through these and see how in every category God gives him exactly double. At the very beginning, he had 7,000 sheep and now he has 14,000, twice the size of the ranch and of the animal. 14,000 sheep. That's a lot of critters to take care of. 
Not only that, but he goes from 3,000 to 6,000 camels. We said that camels were like the semi-trucks of the day. They were used for hauling long distances here. And so he now has 6,000 semi-trucks that are used to haul his freight all over the Middle East. He now has not only these, these camels, but he has a 1,000 yoke of oxen, whereas before he had only 500. And, and we said that the yoke of oxen were like the tractors of the day that, that pulled the plows and the carts out through the fields and, and worked like tractors. And so he has twice as many tractors, as it were. And he has a 1,000 she-asses. Those were the burden bearers, like maybe dump trucks or the local delivery trucks uh, of, the, of the day. And so he has a 1,000 um, delivery trucks that are used to deliver his goods locally. He is a very wealthy man. It comes down into verse number 13 and it says he had also seven sons and three daughters. And you say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Job had seven sons and three daughters at the beginning. How come he didn't get 14? How, that doesn't seem double. It is double because though these first set of children have passed away, you know they are alive with the Lord. And Job still has those. Someday he will go to be with them. And so God gives him another family so that all total he has twice as many as he had before. And one of the things in that day and time was if you were a, an epic person, if you were a great hero, one of the things they highlighted was your daughter's. And so this story, consistent with the time, tells us that Job's daughters were certainly something special. He has three of them. He gives the names of them. Uh, the story writer does here. Jemima is a word that means dove for her grace, for her lovely voice, perhaps for her looks, her figure, her appearance. Keziah comes from the word cassia, which would be like cinnamon. And so she is named after a, an aroma, a beautiful smell. Karen Hopak had to do with uh, eye paint or black rouge to be used to highlight the eyes. Warren Wearsby said that of these three daughters, one daughter by her name has the quietness of a dove. One has the smell of perfume and the other has the beauty of cosmetics. So that they were known, as verse number 15 tells us, as the most beautiful daughters in the land. If Job is richly blessed, he is richly blessed because he has three beautiful daughters. And he is so richly blessed that he not only gives inheritance to his sons, but he's got so much wealth that he gives an inheritance to his daughters as well to take care of them and to bless them. And not only that, but it tells us in verse number 16 that Job lives 140 years after this, giving us an indication that probably at this point in time when the, this ordeal starts, he's 70 years of age. Because everything else has been double. He now gets 140 years. And in that period of time, he doesn't see just his children and his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren, but his great-great-grandchildren for generations. And the story of God's blessing, double blessing upon Job ends with words that are used of Abraham Words that are used of other ones like Isaac and David to describe the blessed life that God gave to them. It tells us in verse 17, so Job died being old and full of days. He lives a full and a rich and a blessed and a wonderful life here. And so when we look at Job, this first point that we see from Job is this, that God was so good to Job. He lives a good long life. God's just incredibly good to Job, and I don't think that's hard to see from these last several verses. But what I want to ask the, and spend the rest of our time on this morning is this. Was God good and right to be so good to Job? How does God's goodness to Job help me go through my suffering? And so I want you to see a second point, and here's where we're going to walk through seven different truths that I really want to help us understand God's goodness. We see it here that God was good to Job, but how does that help me? Here's a second truth that I want you to see, and it says this, God's goodness to Job does not, excuse me, God is so good to be so good. And the first truth that we're going to see is God's goodness to Job, letter A, does not ruin Job serving God for nothing. You know, when you actually study some of these Bible students, there are a few of them that are a little upset at this ending. This is a story about people suffering, and you're going to end with everything going well. 
This is a Hollywood ending. This is a fairy tale ending. If I want a story about, story about suffering, I, I, it should end with the fact that some people's suffering never ends. It should end with the fact that, that, that I have to serve God even if my suffering keeps going the rest of my life. It's not fair that Job's suffering ends. And so they really struggle with it. They think that it ruins the fact that Job served God for nothing. It doesn't ruin it at all. Because the beginning part of this chapter tells me that Job sat in dust and ashes, verse 6, and said, God controls my life. God knows everything, and God can do whatever He wants. And if you read the book of Job, you know that Job believed he was never going to get out of this trouble. He believed the next thing for him was death. He had no concept of, of what was going to happen here. He didn't know the end of the story. As far as he knew, he was going to be in agony and pain and disease and all of this sickness that he had. The only thing left for him was for it to kill him with his life. And Job says, I'm still going to serve God even if I, my, the rest of my existence is suffering and agony. The story has already made that point. And you have to be willing to serve God even if for the rest of your life you do suffer. And so it does not ruin Job's serving God for nothing. But a second point, letter B, that I want you to see is God's goodness to Job makes God even more mysterious. One Bible student told the story of a young Jewish man who was the only person in his family to survive the concentration camps during World War II. The rest of his family died in that awful ordeal. After the war, he came to America and eventually met another survivor of the concentration camps, a young lady, a young Jewish woman, and they married and they raised a family. In his free time, he was a volunteer soccer coach for the high school soccer team. And from time to time, people would ask him to, to tell his story of the ordeal and what he went through and to impart some wisdom to the younger generation. He would speak sometimes in the school's modern history class. Does anybody look at the man whose entire family had died? Does anybody look at that man who suffered such agony and say, well, you had a Hollywood ending, even though... Yes, he married and raised a family and had some of the great pleasures of modern America. If anything, what that man experienced caused even more puzzling questions to come into a person's mind. Why did I survive and the rest of my family didn't? Why did my wife survive and so many of other her, of her loved ones didn't survive? I don't understand this. Why could I experience these good things and they don't? And if anything, some of the goodness that is brought out here is yet still a mystery. Why would God be so good to me and allow those other people to suffer? And listen, that mystery of Job continues. God knows things that you don't know. God understands things that you don't understand. It was one of the truths that Job had to come to terms with and finally give him peace in his soul. God is mysterious. We know what the whisper of God, but there's a whole thunder of his personality and character that we don't understand. God's goodness to Job makes God even more mysterious, that God would choose to be this good God. Because why hasn't God made you the richest man in the East? I'll volunteer. Why, God ha why hasn't God made me the richest man in the East? I don't know. Third thing I want you to see from this passage as we apply it to our lives is God's goodness to Job makes God even more sovereign. Now, I, I maybe didn't word it the best when I say it makes God even more sovereign because God is sovereign. But in our minds, we understand even more so that God is sovereign. See, if you come to these last verses and say, God, I don't like this ending. And God, I don't think it's fair that you would give Job goodness. Then you miss the whole point of the book of Job. The whole point is Job's life belongs to God and God can do whatever He wants to with Job's life. God's sovereign. God's on the throne. God rules and reigns. And so it makes us in our mind when we see this. I don't know all the reasons why God's doing it. He's on the throne. He's in control. He's a sovereign God that chooses to bless. Fourth truth that I want you to see is this. God's goodness to Job shows that suffering will end. 
letter D, suffering will end. Job's suffering had a purpose. God wasn't just some evil, sinister God. No, God had a purpose, and God knew the purpose of this suffering. It was to teach men. It was to defeat Satan. It was to help people have a better understanding of God. And when that purpose was over, the suffering was over as well. And friend, I want to tell you that your suffering will end as well. God's Word and passages and promises like this tell us that your suffering will end as well. You may be cured. You may get a large check in the mail. You may be totally blessed by God. Or it may not end in this life at all, but it will end in the next life. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You aren't going to be stuck in your suffering forever. And the ending of the book of Job reminds us of this. It may end today. It may end in a few years in your life. But if it doesn't end on this, on, on this globe, it will end when you come face to face with Jesus Christ. And that's good news. We need to see that there is an end to the suffering. You aren't stuck in the suffering forever. Number five, God's goodness to Job can be a reward to Job. You know, I want you to really think about this because sometimes we really struggle with, can it be a reward to Job? Is that something that we would, that, that is okay? I mean, wasn't that all part of the reason that the friends got it all wrong is that they thought that Job was suffering simply because he had sinned? No, the Bible principle of sowing and reaping still stands. Galatians 6 and verse 9. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God is still a God of sowing and reaping. God is still a God of bringing rewards, both to the wicked, evil rewards, and to the righteous, godly rewards. The problem in the book of Job wasn't that God is a God of sowing and reaping. The problem was how the friends applied that sowing and reaping to life. And you need to understand That God still is a God of sowing and reaping. He is a God that is just. And you think about a man who was willing to serve God when in one day he loses his entire fortune. A man who is willing to serve God though all of his family is lost. All of his children are lost in one day. Though, Though he loses all of his friends and everybody in society kicks him out and turns away from him. Though all of his closest friends become his enemies. Though he has sickness from his head to his feet. He's still going to serve God. Friend, I want you to know that God's keeping track of your suffering and these verses remind us that God does reward your suffering. And when you stand before the Lord someday, there will be some rewards for the agony and the pain and the suffering that you went through to serve Jesus Christ and to be a testimony in your family and to be a testimony in the community and that you would continue to say, my God is worth serving even if it costs me something. You better believe God is paying attention and keeping track of that and He will bring rewards. Job was saying, my God is so good that I'm not just serving God just for what I can get out of it. God isn't my, my, my means to my end. God is my end. All I want is God. He's my goal. He's my destination. Listen, what is the very essence of sin? It's living for myself. And Job gets to the place where he says, I'm going to serve God even if myself gets absolutely nothing. And God visibly and publicly blesses him. I was reminding my kids yesterday that our world tells us that the physical pleasures and you can just be promiscuous and all of that that's out there are so great and so wonderful. But you be faithful to your marriage and you will know result rewards that they could never possibly imagine. You honor your God with your income and God may choose to bless you in ways that boggle your mind. You honor your parents And you'll know rewards and blessings for that that will make your life well worth it. You spend time reading the Word and having the Word inside of you on a daily basis and you'll know blessings and treasures and rewards and reap consequences that no one else can even imagine. You invest in the lives of children and God may very well bless you with the joy of seeing many children come to know Jesus Christ. You need to look at these last verses and say, it's a rewarding thing to serve Jesus Christ with my life. 
And we need these verses. Let me give you two more and we'll be done here. Two great truths. Letter F. God's goodness to Job is necessary to the point of the story that even in suffering, God is still worth serving. The story of Job teaches us that our God controls every human life and He may choose to allow your life to go through suffering. And in fact, the Bible tells us it's not just a possibility, but Timothy tells us, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And here you're going through this suffering, and here you come to this book of, of, of Job, and you find out, oh no, suffering's going to come in my life. Agony is going to come in my life. It may not be persecution. It may not be for you that you lose your fortune. It may not be that you'll be disowned by your family. It may be those things. It may be something else. I don't know. The Lord knows what you're suffering. And you look at this all and you say, is it really worth it to serve God in all of this? You have this nagging feeling that serving God could lead to this awful experience. I mean, here you are and you're looking out and you say, wow, pastor's been preaching on if we serve Jesus with our life, we're going to suffer. I think I'll make another choice. I think I'll choose to do something different. And the book of Job tells us this, that even if you suffer all of your life, it's still the best life. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go. You may suffer and you may have all of these difficulties in your life, but as you look at the testimony of Job, you are reminded that even in all of the suffering, it's still a great, great life. And young people, I get it. You go to church while the rest of your friends play all day, every Sunday. Christianity is still the best life. And men, you give 10% of your income every year while all the other men have 10% of their income for their hobbies and their toys. Christianity is still the best life. Well, everyone is secluded in their private little backyards and, and minding their business and not worried about anybody around them. You have this crazy pastor that says, you should get out of your backyard and go meet your neighbors. You know what? Christianity is still the best life. And you may be called to serve God far, far, far away from your family. Christianity is still the best life. You may be called to live in an area that's freezing cold or burning hot for the rest of your life. Christianity is still the best life. You may be given the opportunity to serve people who don't care about your God. Christianity is still the best. Christianity is still twice as good as anything else that's out there. Don't shrink away from the suffering and don't walk away from God. Embrace it because Christianity is still the best thing that there is out there. came across a powerful story this week of a, of a woman she told how she had met a man and married him and she, he, he just kind of gave her security and, and made her feel good and, and really helped her self-image and things like this. Kind of her trophy husband, I guess you might say. And after a while, she found out some sins of his past and that he continued to live in some of those sins. And after six and a half years, her husband walked away from her, leaving her with two little girls. How could a woman who, go, who had gone through an experience like that look up and say, but God is good? She could say that because she said, God has shown me that I'm safe and satisfied and content only in God. It wasn't that my satisfaction was in Him or my safety or my contentment was in Him. I found it in the Lord. It boggles my mind to think of these things and people having these testimonies. And I just want to encourage everyone, instead of, instead of looking at the suffering that Christians face and all you have to give up and all the sacrifices, and yes, our church does believe in a cause that costs you something. It's going to cost you to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and you will suffer and you will give up th things. But I still want to tell you, Christianity is double better than anything else that's out there. Christianity is the best thing I know. It's worth it to follow Jesus. And the last truth that I want you to see is this. God's goodness to Job shows that God is amazingly good. The goodness of God has been hinted out a little bit all the way through this book. In chapters uh, 38 and 39, God talks about and asks Job whether he knows about the creation, and God cares about the birthing of little animals. 
And God cares about things that have food. He makes sure that they're fed every day because he's just a good God. And now we come to the closing verses of this and we find that God is just a good God. Can you imagine what it would be like for a big group of us and others as well to sit down at a big banquet table in heaven? You have a nice big tall glass of lemonade and we're sitting outside by the the river of life and we're just enjoying some fellowship and there's a hundred people sitting around the table maybe. And they're all different. They're all talking. One person brings up the fact that someone in our church, one of the dear ladies of our church, suffered chronic pain for years and years. She suffered on this planet. And yet she bore it gracefully. You know what? Across the table, another lady says, you know what? Yes, I remembered that. And you know, when I went through hardships and when I went through difficulties difficulties in my life, I would look at her testimony and how she bore that gracefully. And it was such an encouragement to me to keep going for God. And the first lady in chronic pain never knew that, never knew the testimony she was, never knew the blessing that she was to anybody else and just stops and thinks, wow, God is so good to allow my suffering to be an impact to somebody else. There's another dear lady who has suffered the sorrow of a miscarriage. And she knows the pain and sorrow of that. And she speaks to another lady and says, you know, I remember when you came to my house and you sat down with me and you talked to me and you put your arm around my shoulder and you helped me through that difficulty. And with tears in her eyes, the other lady thinks back to the pain and the sorrow and the hurt of her own soul as she went through that experience, but now rejoicing that God allowed her to minister to the needs of somebody else. Another lady at another part of the table speaks up and she says, you know what, I I really struggled with boldness in my witness. And then I read about these women in other parts of the country and other parts of the world. And, and when they trust Jesus Christ, they're beaten and they're, they're ostracized and their husbands uh, hurt them and kick them out of their, their own homes. And I looked at these other women who said, yes, but Jesus Christ is greater and I'm going to serve God even if I suffer. And I thought, well, I can serve God with my life and I can be a bold witness. And I started witnessing it. Other people came to know Jesus Christ as Savior. And she points to that lady and she says, I read your story and your testimony was a blessing to me. Can you imagine the joy? Can you imagine the smiles around the table as all of a sudden all of these different agonies and sufferings and pains begin to be shared and people begin to connect the dots and somebody says, yours was a testimony to me and and yours was a help to me. And as everybody's rejoicing in how God turns such suffering into such good things, Jesus Christ walks up. And everybody just falls to their knees in worshiping Him because He's that good of a God to do all of this through suffering. What gets you through suffering is the fact that God is a sovereign God, but when you think about the fact that God is a sovereign God, it raises other questions. If He's a sovereign God, then why does He allow such suffering? Why does He allow uh, people to suffer unjustly? And what you need to do is see then the goodness of God. He doesn't delight in beating his servants. He doesn't delight in torturing you. He's not waiting at youth conventions for some teenager to to sign up and say, I'm going to serve God with my life. Okay, I got him. Let's make him suffer. That's not God. God is a good and a wonderful God. And 2,000 years after the story of Job, a Bible student named James was inspired in James chapter 5 and verse 11 to write about this. And he said, Behold, we count them happy, blessed, which endure. I don't think that way naturally. Oh, look how blessed they are to endure such suffering. No, but the Word of God says they're blessed. So why is it that the literature and the stories, the movies, the TV shows, whatever, have this desire for a good ending? Because for those that know the Lord, there is a good ending. God has designed the story of life to have a good ending. One person, Tolkien, called it this, a you catastrophe. You meaning good, a good catastrophe. God even uses catastrophes to bring good things out of it. And you have to say with the psalmist, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of God in the hand of the living. Have you stopped to consider all the good things that God did through Job? 
Wrong views of God were corrected. Satan was defeated. Job saw God in a greater way. Job was a testimony to still serving God, even if nothing changed, even if he suffered, even if he prayed for his enemies there. And Job had the blessings of, of his future life, as well as all of eternity in front of him. God was a good God. The disciples, Mark chapter 10, verse 28, Then Peter began to say unto them, Lord, we have left all and have followed thee. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sister, or mother, father, wife, children, or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. Mark chapter 8 and verse number 35, For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels of the same shall save it. 1 Peter 4, 8, or for, excuse me, 1 Timothy 4, 8, For bodily exercise profit little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Psalm 34, verse 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear Him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk up uprightly. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. And the story of Job ends with this smile-giving blessing bursting forth in our hearts that God is good. And friends, when it comes to Christianity, the core of what we believe is called the gospel. And what is the gospel? The very word gospel means good news. Because it starts with the bad news that we've all sinned and we all deserve to spend eternity separated from God in, in burning agony in a horrible place called the lake of fire. But because Jesus Christ loved us, He died on the cross for our sins. That's the good news. And if we'll simply put our faith, oh, it's not about good works, it's not about trying to earn our way to God, but simply by putting our faith and dependence in Him, the good news is He will save us from our sins, give us a relationship with Him, and we can spend all of eternity with Him in a wonderful place called heaven. That is good news. It's an awesome thing. There's a little boy named John. At the age of five, he was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. He would die by the time he was 25. Every year of John's life, though he got older, he lost use of more and more of his body. A little part of his life would, would deteriorate and would go away. But there was one moment that stood out. It happened. He was invited to an NFL fundraising auction. When it began, one particular item caught John's eye. It was a basketball that was signed by all the players of the Sacramento Kings. They were going to auction it off, this fundraising NFL auction. John so desperately wanted that basketball that all the players had signed that when they started the bidding, though he was just kind of there as a guest, his hand just shot up in the air. His mom was terrified. We don't have that kind of money. Put your hand down. We can't buy these sorts of things. We're just here to watch the whole thing. And the bidding went on. He wasn't bidding, but they were watching it, and the bidding went higher and higher and higher, and everybody was just amazed at this basketball that, that the bidding kept going higher and higher and higher, and finally somebody bought this signed basketball for some astronomical amount of money to be donated to this cause. The person that bought it walked up to the front, picked up the basketball, and, and turned around, and instead of walking back to his seat, walked over to John and put the ball in John's hands. Sometime later, John would say how unbelievably shocked he was that that happened to him. And ask the question, has anybody ever done something to you that when they did it, you just thought that was unbelievably good of them to do it? I didn't do anything to deserve it. They were just so good to me. And friends, listen, that's the gospel and that's our God. So that when all is said and done, we sit there not like a little boy with a basketball, but in an infinitely greater way. And we sit there through all the suffering and all the agony of our lives and we step back and we say, yes, but my God is good. 
he's really, really good. And he's worth serving and suffering all of my life because he's good. Is that your testimony in your heart? Or when the sufferings and agonies of your life come, do you tend to turn away from the Lord and get mad and angry at God? Father, I do thank you for the testimony of the book of Job and what you chose to do in his life, how he chose to respond. And I pray that you would help us to believe, to see the goodness of God in our lives, even when we're going through suffering or things don't go the way that we choose and the the way that we want them to go. I pray that you'd strengthen every person here to see that goodness of God. Help them, we pray. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Just let me ask you two questions before we're done here this morning. Would there be anybody here that says, I haven't received the gospel of Jesus Christ. I haven't put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ to be my Savior. I want to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you quietly slip up your hand and say, that's me. I need to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. I won't call out your name, but I'd like to know God's doing that work in your heart. And Christian, second question is this. Has God challenged you about the goodness of God? And you say, I needed to see the goodness of God. I need to believe to see the goodness of God in my life. You say, that's me. That's my testimony. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you quietly slip up your hand? That's me. I needed to see. Yes, yes, others. The goodness of God in my life. I'm going to allow you to do business with God and just pray right there as the piano begins to play. Pray that you'll see the goodness of God in your life. Let's all stand and we're going to sing our closing song here. God is so good. He's so good to me. The words will be up on the screen here. And let's go ahead and sing this. God is so good to me. Sing it out with all your heart. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to His goodness and His death, He died for me, He died for me, He died for me, me. He's so good, He's good to answer our prayers. He answers prayer, He answers prayer, He answers prayer, He's so good to, He's coming soon, He's coming soon, He's coming soon, He's coming soon. He's so good to me. It's a good God. I hope that that sticks with you as the last message from the book of Job. We're going to give just a few minutes to howdy with each other, and then we'll kind of rendezvous. Maybe we can kind of gather back up in here. Those of you that are planning on going, we'll divide up into some groups that are going to the different fire stations and to get you out and on your way, all right? And uh, that's a great blessing. Let's just have a word of prayer and thank God truly for our fire department. And uh, then we'll go. Father, we thank you for these who give of their time and of their lives to serve us in this way. We pray pray your protection upon them. We pray that you would give them strength. And as they work uh, unusual hours through the nights and help their bodies to get the rest that they need, we pray your blessing upon their homes. And most of all, spiritually, Lord, in love for them, we pray that they would know Jesus Christ as Savior and know our God who is so good. And so we pray for these in Jesus' name. Amen. Maranatha.